right, good morning, church. How are you today? Good. Love seeing your faces. Uh, man, as you know, uh, or may not know, this is the last week uh, in our study uh, in Colossians. Uh, this is really, this is the 11th week, the final message of this study uh, in Paul's letter to the Colossian church that we're calling Raised, right? And uh, we have, we've essentially learned, in short, that we are, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Never forget that. That's the foundation, right? That is what we are building everything about our lives in this church on is, is, is belief in the gospel, right? And his work on the cross on our behalf for a future eternal inheritance. But we've also been learning, man, something else happens, right, that we can often forget, right? We are spiritually resurrected. We are spiritually resurrected to new life here and now. We don't have to wait until we die and go to heaven, right, for, for new life to start, right? It doesn't, it's not completed here, right, but it starts here, this new life, and we're learning about how God's grace, it shapes our new resurrected life here and now. And today we are in Colossians chapter, uh, chapter 4, verses 7 to 18, Right, So a big chunk of, of, of verses, and last week uh, we learned that we are raised to engage the world around us. You remember that? We are raised to engage the world around us, and Paul, he gave us some kind of ROEs, right, rules of engagement, and what were those rules of engagement? We are, we are raised to engage the world with prayer, we are raised to engage the world with wisdom, and we are raised to engage the world with careful words. You remember that? Right today, we actually now learn that we are raised to engage the world around us together. Together. That is the key point. Now, you guys know I, you, you, you guys know I love movies, right? Um, pretty soon, it's a big deal for me if you love movies. I know some other movie lovers, too. It's a big deal. Uh, the Oscar season is coming up. It's October to February every year. And basically, from October to February every year, what's expected to be critically acclaimed movies, they all come to the theaters, right, October to February. We move past the summer blockbusters. They never win awards. They're never nominated in the Oscars. But all these critically acclaimed movies come out in February to, to, from, from October to February. And you guys know the drill. I love watching uh, the Oscars when possible. You guys know the drill in the Oscar awards. The awards are going to be followed up by speeches, right? Most of which will go something like this. Oh, my gosh. Like, I can't believe I won, even though they can believe it. <laughs> they can't believe I've won. Uh, what an honor to be chosen amongst all these awesome nominees. And I, I want to take an opportunity, right, to speak against the evils of air pollution, right? And then they'll say something like, well, I, I want to thank my private jet pilot, my, my helicopter pilot. I want to thank, you know, my, my driver and my mom and my cat and my, my, my you know, whatever, my chiropractor, whatever it is. <laughs> And eventually, right, the orchestra begins playing, and that's, that's when we get excited that they don't, can't talk anymore and the speech is over to everyone's relief. But guys, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, why do actors spend time thanking people? Why do they, why do they spend time thanking people? It's because they realize that nobody makes it on their own, right? Nobody makes it on their own, and particularly at church, right? God... He has created mankind to, to thrive in relationships, right? To be in relationships and thrive in relationships, to be in community. It really does take a village to enjoy his creation together. And in this case here in the church, churches, right? Churches and the gospel going forth in the church community and outside of it, it requires all of us together together. All of us together, not just one person, not just a few people, all of us together and growing and, and standing mature in Christ and being fully assured in all the will of God, it requires all of us together, not just one person or a few people, all of us together. So I, I'm just going to share, I want to talk about three things today, and uh, these three things are uh, in truth together Right? And we're going to talk about, we're going to be challenged together, and, and we're, going to, we're going to talk about, we're going to be warned together. Okay, so in truth together, challenged together, and warned together. I need prayer. Let's pray before we get into the text. Father, thank you for this word. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, my word is not your word. Your word is your word. 
Thank you for um, transmitting your, your, your thoughts and your presence and your, who you are and your, your commands and your expectations and your grace and your, your steadfast love and kindness, Lord, and all of these things through your word. And uh, Father, as we close out Colossians today, Lord, I, I pray that um, everything just comes together, Lord, first full circle, and we see uh, just how important um, ministry is uh, in doing it together. And all of us finding our place and having our place in the ministry that you're doing in your church, Lord. Um, I just pray that uh, we would have ears to hear and, and eyes to see and um, to, to digest this and to, uh, that we would, it would help, help us and make us think, Father, um, about what you would be calling us to do uh, in your kingdom here on earth. And I thank you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said, we are in uh, chapter 4 of Colossians. The, it's the end of the letter, verses 7 to 18, so a decent chunk. And, and it says this. It says, it says, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that we may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our, fellow, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only, these are the only men of the, of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epiphras, who was one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, and that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Lydicae and in and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at, brothers at Lydicae and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Lydicans, and see that you also read the letter from Lydicae, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So that first thing I want to talk about, in truth, together, Right throughout this letter, Paul, he has shared with the Colossian Christians so many truths, right, to ground ourselves in, right? We are raised by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We, we are qualified, you remember we, in the beginning of this, we are qualified by God to share in an eternal inheritance. We can't qualify ourselves. God qualifies us. We are reconciled with God all of this amazing truth, these tre treasure chests of truth. Christ is in us, we learned. Christ is in us. We have died with Christ, right? We are alive in Christ. We have been raised with Christ. We are hidden with Christ. We are God's chosen ones. We are holy. We are beloved. All of these truths. And we have seen, right, how all of these truths settle deeply in the heart and that, and that they move us toward action, Right? We have seen all these responses, these commands that have been given us to, to what? To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit, right? Not shifting from the hope of the gospel. There is not hope in anything else, right? But the gospel, right? He talked about being rooted and built up in Christ and, and established in the faith and not allowing ourselves to be taken captive by human philosophies and worldly philosophies, right? He talked about seeking the things that are above, right? Setting our minds on things that are above and not on things on earth, right? Putting to death what is earthly in you and putting on the character of Christ, right? We learned about submissiveness, 
We learned about submif submif oh my gosh, submissiveness, right? Submissiveness to the various authorities around us that God has established. We learned about working hard, right, for the Lord and not man, right? And being steadfast in prayer. We learned walking in wisdom and letting our speech be gracious. So what is today's truth that we are being commanded and called to live in? What is today's truth? Well, when you read Paul's letters, right, it can seem like this guy is on a one-man mission, right? You read his letters and they're all from Paul. It seems like he's kind of on a one-man mission, but that actually couldn't be further from the truth. That actually couldn't be further from the truth. In the background of Paul's ministry and the ministry of these churches he wrote to, there were many partners. There were many people, right, doing the ministry of Jesus in these churches. Many people. It wasn't just Paul. And here, Paul, he basically lists this roster of men and women along with some general roles that they play in. And the interesting thing is, too, this is really important because Paul doesn't always do this. Only twice in his letters does he list, give us a list of men and women and the work that they're doing. He does it in Romans 16, if you want to check that out sometime. Romans 16 and Colossians 4, it's the only time that he does it, that he pulls the curtain back, and we're able to see, wow, this isn't, all, this isn't about Paul at all. Right? Paul is just one piece of a puzzle that God is doing within the church. And we see this roster, this list of men and women. Look, Tychicus, right? What we see there in the text, well, he was a messenger. He delivered this letter to the Colossian church. He also delivered the letter to the Ephesian church. You have Onesimus. Onesimus was a personal assistant to Paul. Aristarchus was a companion and a fellow prisoner of Paul. And he always seemed to be, when you look through Paul's letters, he always seemed to be with Paul in the hard times. He was a comforter. He was an encourager. We have Mark, right? Mark, Mark was a comforter to Paul. Mark, was, Mark also, interestingly enough, also with Mark, Mark, that's the Mark that Mark and Paul had division with. They had division with each other, and they went their separate ways, and then they eventually came back together again. The relationship was reconciled, and they continued to do ministry together. Justice, right? He was another comforter of Paul's in, in his imprisonment. We have this gentleman named Epiphras. The scripture says he was zealous for prayer. He was a prayer warrior. He was zealous for prayer. And then we have Luke there in the text. Luke was the physician. And if you don't know, Luke was also the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, doing great work. And then we have this man named Demas. Nothing really much is said here about Demas, but he was clearly of value to the ministry that was happening within these churches at the time. And then we have this woman. Her name was Nympha. This woman, right, she was a woman who hosted a church in her home, right, bringing forth and developing powerful, important ministry within the church. And then this guy named Archippus. Archippus was presumed to be the leader of the church in Colossae. Listen, guys, Paul, Paul, he was intellectually and spiritually gifted, and he was highly influential, right? But Paul was just one person. He was just one person of many doing ministry. Paul had a ministry of team. Uh, he had a ministry team. It wasn't just about Paul. He had a team of, of, of message carriers and encouragers, right, and comforters and prayer warriors and house church hosts, and, and that's just all we see there. There were many other things going on within the church, many men and women that were sharing in the work of the ministry at that time. They had many differences, they, all, they had many differences we see there in the text, right? There were Jews and there were Gentiles, right? All these people came from different places. They came from different backgrounds. Nothing was everything. Nobody was everything to everybody, right? They all served according to their differing commitments and, and, and their strengths, right? But the one key character, the characteristic that they had in common was they were all faithful. They were all faithful. They were living in truth together faithful, living in truth together, and they were pushing forward the gospel wherever it is they were. Guys, in bringing the mystery of Christ that we've learned about in this study to the world, 
right, and helping believers stand mature and fully assured in the will of God, in the will of God. That's the truth that we see here. Right there, there was a group of people that they were working together and each pulling in the same direction. And, and churches and the gospel going forth in the church community and outside of it, it requires all of us together, not just one person or a few, growing and standing mature in Christ and, and fully assured in all the will of God requires all of us together not just one person or a few. So let's be challenged together. That's that next point, challenged together. Guys, the challenge here is this. The challenge here is this. We should leave here with the message that Paul gives to Archippus in verse 17. What's he say? See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. We have all received ministry from the Lord. If you believe the gospel, we are all called to some sort of ministry. You have all received ministry from the Lord. God didn't save you to do nothing. God didn't save me to do nothing, right? If you stand here saved by God's grace, it is a miracle. It is a miracle, and it's not to do nothing, it is not to do nothing. And from, for some, he clearly calls to a specific ministry. For others, right, he calls to serve where their need is. Sometimes he calls us to both, right? But every believer has a place, right? What is your place in God's ministry in the world and in your church community and in this case, Streamsong Church? What is your place in this? It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Everybody's role, as we can see here in the text, it contributes to the larger mission of declaring the mystery of Christ. Don't look at me and think I've got the most important ministry, right? That's the most valuable ministry, preaching or, or planting a church. Guys, I am just one piece of this puzzle of many people putting ministry together, right, and pushing the gospel forward in this church community and outside of it. It doesn't matter what it is. They're all important. They are all valuable. Guys, it could be serving any of those needs that we communicated during announcements. It could be any of those needs. It could be serving in other areas where there isn't a particular need. That list that we gave wasn't it. <laughs> those were just kind of the needs that we see, but there's all lots of other ways right, to serve within the church. It could be on Sundays, right? It could be preaching, right? It could be, it could be the coffee ministry or the audio and the visual team, the worship bands, right? It could be greeting. It could be set up and tear down. It could be the prayer response team after the sermons. It could be on non-Sundays too, right? It could be leading or co-leading or hosting a small group, just like Nympha did, hosting a small group. It could be liaisoning between the church and right, our partners or something like that. Right? It could be meal trains, right? prayer ministries we have. Like on that list, social media, right? that's all modern ministry that we do today. It could be website management, right? all of those things. It could be finance and accounting ministry. All of these you put together to push forward the ministry in the church and outside of it. It could be Operation right, Snack Storm. You guys know what that is. If you remember, it's my name for it, and I love it. We're not going away from it. You could be an Operation Snack Storm runner where we stock teacher break rooms in three schools right now in Doylestown, and we got runners. Right? I order the snacks on Amazon. I have it shipped to their houses, and then they... And then they, they, they bring them in their car to the schools. You could do that. We're, look, we're looking to add schools, right? There is a plethora of ways to find a place in Jesus' ministry in Central Bucks in Doylestown. If I were ever to be named, guys, I would want to be named. I would want to be named not for my own glory, not for my own recognition, I want to be an intimate part of the work being done for the kingdom of God, wherever I am. I want to be an intimate part of that work. And in this case, it's Streamsong. 
What could be better than to be named among a few? What could be better than that, to have your name listed there in Colossians chapter 4, bringing heaven on earth and pushing forward the gospel? What could be better than being named for the work that you're doing, not for your own glory and not for your own recognition, but man, I'm just, I'm a part of what God is doing. Guys, no matter what I do, you know, I, I coach a high school golf team. I did. I coach a college golf team now. And guys, at the end of the day, this is my team right here. This is my team. All that other stuff, it doesn't really matter that much. You can do it. It's okay. There's a place for it. But when I'm on my deathbed, I'm not going to think about, man, I wish I, I coached another golf team or something. No, I'm going to look back at my life, and my legacy is going to be the work that I put in for God's ministry in Jesus' church. And Streamsong might not be in Streamsong forever. It could be another church in the future. I don't know. The church is always my team. You guys are my team. And there is no better team in this world to be a part of and for my family to be a part of than the ministry of Jesus' church as we do these eternal things that last forever within the church. And so we're walking in truth together. We're challenged together. And now I, I want to warn us together because something else that we see that you might not be able to notice here in this text Right? This text also comes with a warning. And that warning comes from this man, Demas. This man, Demas. You know, about five years after this letter, it's, it's recorded in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10. Paul wrote this about Demas. This is the Demas in our text. He made the list. He made the list. He made the roster. He was doing something valuable. Not a much says, it doesn't say much about Demas, but he made it. He must have been doing something awesome. And then five years later, Paul writes to, to, to Timothy. He says, Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. He has deserted Paul in the ministry you know, the original Greek word for deserted implies that Demas had not only left Paul, but he had left him. It literally means in the lurch, in the lurch. And what that means is to, to, it means to leave someone without help or protection when it is needed. That is, Demas had abandoned Paul in a time of great need while he was in prison and facing a death sentence. You know, it's, it is never easy to see a friend or to see an associate, right, whom you place so much trust in forsake your ministry, especially in the midst of a hard place. But listen, this separation caused by Demas, it wasn't spatial. It wasn't just spatial. It was spiritual. It was spiritual. He says, because he loved this world. He loved this world. Demas lost enthusiasm for the ministry. He lost enthusiasm for it and left because he fell in love with the world. He loved too much the things of this life, the temporary things. He started storing up treasures here on earth and not in heaven. He loved this world too much. Demas chose the, the corrupt value system of this world and not the value system of heaven. Right? This tragedy, it is still being lived out by those who choose the benefits of the world over eternal riches in heaven every day. It's happening. Many receive the word, but the worries of life, right, and the deceitfulness of wealth Choke the word out, right? Making it unfruitful. Guys, it's a reminder to us that our past service is no guarantee of future faithfulness. It's not. My service to yesterday is not a guarantee of faithfulness tomorrow or today. 
It is every day I have to wake up and I have to remember something. I have to remember the grace of God. I have to remember the grace of God. We must be depending on the Lord and his strength and not doing all this stuff, this ministry in our own strength, but we are doing it by grace. The church, it needs men and women, right, who labor and endure by, by clinging to the grace of God because it's the grace of God that empowers us. It gives us the power. It gives us the power to, to endure, right, to, to labor, even in, under the harshest conditions and the hardest of times. Guys, we may say we believe in grace, right? Our minds may say that, but our heart may still believe in self-salvation, right, and, and, ser and serving to earn the favor from God. But guys, self-salvation will eventually crush us. Serving to earn God's favor will absolutely crush us eventually, and the crushing weight will eventually lead to disillusionment. Disillusionment in that space, creating, making that space between us and the ministry, and we start to love the things of this world again, start to love this life too much again. Guys, this happens because no matter what we do, right, no matter what we do, it'll never be enough. You can't serve enough. Like we're talking about God here. You cannot serve enough to please him. You can't do it. But that's the point. We don't serve to please him. We serve because he saved us. We serve because of salvation. We serve because of his grace, not because we're trying to earn it. No matter how much you serve, it will never be enough because you cannot please him by serving. Guys, but serving from grace, serving from grace, and it's freeing and it's empowering. Grace is the fuel, right? It's the fuel that keeps the flame burning, even in the most trying of circumstances and, and, the, and the hardships that we can be going through. Man, imagine a team Imagine a team serving and doing ministry from grace, not for grace. Doing it from grace, where that foundation is grace. We're not doing it for grace. That is a powerful team. That is a powerful team. That is a powerful ministry. Guys, we labor and we endure together by grounding ourselves in all of those truths that we've learned the past 10 weeks, right? We are raised by grace, right? We are, we, we, we are, we are qualified by God to share in a future inher eternal inheritance. We don't qualify ourselves. God qualifies us. That's amazing, and in Christ, we are reconciled to the living God. We don't have to do anything except believe in what Jesus has done on the cross for our sins. We are reconciled to the living God. Christ is in us, right? He is in us. We, we died with Christ. Our old self died with Christ. We are alive with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. We are hidden with Christ. And so we live in truth together we live in that truth together that grace and we have been challenged together and, and we have been warned together man let's pray